All righty. Uh, hi, everybody. Let me just share my screen here. Um, make sure you all can see it. Okay, can you all see my PowerPoint? Yeah, okay, awesome. Um, so um, again, I'm Audrey. Uh, I, my lecture today is Major Depressive Disorder uh, Essentials for the Outpatient Internist. Um, so are any of you interested in going into primary care or doing some outpatient work? Maybe, hard to see everybody. Um, so, uh, Basically, if you do go into outpatient care, I'm hoping that this will kind of help solidify some of the basics um, or even just for the rest of your residency. Um, I was hoping the interns would be here because I think this would be a good lecture for some of the essentials, but um, for you guys, hopefully it's at least a good refresher and kind of solidifying some things. Um, and just a little bit about me, I actually did internal medicine residency uh, all three years before starting psych here. So uh, I've been in your shoes, so I know how rough it can be. <laughs> and I, I tried to keep this relevant for you guys. Uh, no disclosures. Uh, here's a brief outline. So we'll first talk about epidemiology and health disparities, then go into a little bit of pathophys, then screening and diagnosis, and then treatment is probably the bulk of the lecture. And then if we have time, I've got just a couple of practice questions at the end. Uh, so just to start things off, this is my cat who looks like he's in a bit of existential crisis mode, uh, which I imagine is how a lot of you feel when trying to deal with mental health, especially if you haven't had a lot of um, good exposure or just feel uncomfortable with it. So, uh, I'm sure you guys are well aware based on what you've already seen in your clinics, um, but why is this a primary care lecture? So um, the stats always surprise me. Um, so about 60% of mental health care is done by primary care providers. So um, you guys, family medicine docs, um, you're the ones really prescribing most of the antidepressants in the world and doing most of the mental health care. Um, also, it's hugely important for suicide prevention. Um, I found this interesting study that showed that um, in patients who attempt suicide, 38% uh, of them saw a provider within one week um, and about 60% within four weeks of the attempt. Um, and most of these visits were at primary care. So you guys in the office are really on the front lines of uh, preventing suicide for a lot of these patients. Um, as we all know, depression versus life functioning and medical outcomes. Um, and ethnic minorities are also much less likely to be seen by us and more likely to be seen by you. Um, so very important for you guys. Um, I'll open it up to the group. Uh, what percentage of US adults had an episode of depression? Um, I'll have you guys take a guess. I don't know if a poll popped up for you, but you can just kind of tell your answer, put it in the chat too. Yeah, poll is going. I'm gonna, we're we're actually pretty near everybody voting. So I'm gonna go ahead and just. Okay, so most of you voted D, um, which is pretty close. It's not quite that bad, thankfully. <laughs> Um, but it's still 8.4%, which is pretty high. Um, that's pretty close to one in 10 people. Um, break it down a little bit more, a little bit higher in females, um, higher in younger populations, and higher in those who reported more than one race. And of course, COVID has not helped any of that. Um, so yeah, pretty prevalent in the world. Um, this is a fairly busy slide. Um, but I did want to talk about health disparities in depression. I'm sure you guys get a lot of health disparities talks um, for the rest of medicine, but I tried to just narrow things down for um, things that are specific to depression and mental health. So we'll kind of just talk through these. 
Um, so one thing that I didn't really uh, recognize until this year, um, it can be a lot harder for minority patients to find a therapist with a shared background. And a shared background is something that's really important for a lot of patients because you're revealing a lot of very personal things, a lot of cultural context goes into it. Um, so that can be pretty challenging. Um, there's discrepancies in screening. Um, so people are more likely to be screened if they're white, female, or middle-aged. Um, there are certain at-risk groups. Um, so risk of depression um, and a suicide attempt is higher in uh, people who, have, who are in sexual orientation minority groups, as well as transgender and non-binary individuals um, compared to those who are heterosexual and cis cisgender. Um, there are differences in who actually seeks care if they're in a mental health crisis. Um, so one study showed that Black males tend to be more hesitant in seeking care. Um, and importantly, there's a pretty at-risk group that is actually at, a highest, at the highest risk of quitting mental health services. Um, and that's patients who are non-Caucasian, younger, lower income, lower education, and more, more comorbidities. So if you have these patients in your clinic, um, it's just really important to be mindful that they are at higher risk of um, probably quitting medical services in general, but especially mental health services. Um, there are differences in who uses antidepressants. Um, so there's higher use in white patients, women, and those with higher levels of education. And of course, racial, racial and cultural biases play an enormous role. So I just kind of made a separate slide for that. Um, so mental health and depression is pretty distinct from the rest of medicine because unfortunately we don't have labs or imaging to tell us what the diagnosis is, which makes it challenging. And it also uh, means that you have to take a person's background and cultural context into consideration. Um, oh, I just saw a question. What percentage of healthcare providers are dealing with depression? I actually don't know that answer off the top of my head. Um, I think it's pretty high, <laughs> uh, but I don't, I would have to look up the answer, but that's a great question. Um, so uh, anyway, sorry, getting back to the slide. So um, whenever you're asking someone about their mental health symptoms, you have to take in their personal life context. So I found these two terms that um, were pretty useful to me. So clinician bias basically assumes that depression looks different depending on what someone's ethnicity is versus cultural relativity assumes that depression looks the same in everyone. Um, and really neither of this is fully correct. Um, you're either assigning cultural differences or ignoring them. Um, so it's good to keep in mind kind of where you tend to fall in this. Um, there's also a common belief that the threshold for both physical and psychological pain in minorities is higher, which leads to minimizing symptoms and misdiagnosis and undertreatment. Mm -hmm. um, if you're interested, this book, Crazy Like Us, is fantastic. Um, I had it on audiobook earlier this year. Um, just goes into a lot more detail about the different um, cultural, geographic manifestations of mental illness throughout the world. And it's really interesting because it varies a whole lot uh, by where you are. All right, uh, moving on to mechanism and pathophys. So uh, I'll open this up to the group as well. Um, whoever wants to share, uh, what are some things that cause depression? There's a lot of answers, so you can just <laughs> throw anything out there. Life stressors, big changes. Yeah, definitely. Um, other things? I see something in the chat. Trauma, for sure. Yeah, so you guys have mentioned, oh, where did my mouse go? There it is. Alcohol, lack of sleep. Yeah, so substance, insomnia. Yeah, so you've mentioned some um, family history, definitely. 
great. So um, essentially, lots of things. <laughs> uh, things that are both inherent to the person and in terms of their genetic makeup and epigenetics. Um, you guys mentioned a lot of um, social and environmental things that can cause depression. Um, other things like substance abuse, um, psychological adversity, um, other endocrine factors. There's a whole lot. And most of the time, it's not just one thing that causes depression. It's a combination of what's going on in someone's life, as well as um, their genetic makeup and how they respond to these traumas. So this is a model that I think can be pretty useful. Um, it, it's basically a flow sheet of how depression symptoms arise. So if you start with someone's environment and genetics that can lead to immunologic and endocrine responses, these cause um, structural changes in the brain. This leads to dysfunctional neurogenesis and neurotransmission, and that's how you ultimately get symptoms. Um, so that is one um, common theory used to describe depression, uh, but ultimately it's just really complicated. Um, and the reason I talked about this at all is uh, it can be helpful to understand why we use the therapy and the medications that we do. Um, and it can be helpful for some patients when they ask, why am I depressed? Um, just to be able to give them some context. Um, just be mindful though, some, like for example, some patients really latch on to the idea that, oh, it's just my brain chemistry. That means I can't control it. Like I feel more at peace with that. Versus some patients take that and say, it's my brain chemistry. That means it's out of my control and that terrifies me. So <laughs> um, kind of just talk about different things with your patient, kind of see what, you know, works best for them. Um, and I like this quote that essentially says, with depression, there's no one size fits all. Uh oh, Audrey, I don't know if you can hear us, but we, it, it looks like you're frozen. Uh, all right, so this is where we left off. Um, so who wants to share an idea of what depression looks like for a patient? All right, I'll help you guys out here. Uh, so uh basically it can look really different for a lot of people okay so someone put it in the chat pretty flat okay um yeah so oftentimes the sometimes tearful um so often what people think of as depression is someone who is flat they're down they're unmotivated um, sometimes people can be, you know, more expressive, very sad and tearful. Um, some people, though, it can look completely different. Some people, it's mainly like they're not sleeping, they're not eating, they can still socialize and look okay to the outside, but inside they're just not the same. Um, and uh, what I was hoping to get at is essentially that depression can look different for a lot of different people. Um, you know, people have different symptoms worse than other symptoms, and that really varies depending on the patient. Um, the other thing to remember is that not all symptoms are pathological. Um, so, uh, I'll just use the example of the flat affect in the chat. So, um, affect can be tricky because, um, in you know, typical American culture, we expect people to be very expressive with their emotions and their voice tones and, you know, very smiley. Some people just don't do that. Some people just have resting flat face, I guess. <laughs> um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, you know, so it's important to talk with the patient, like, is this causing you harm? 
if they're not falling asleep until 4 a.m. Is that because they can't sleep or because they just have a really wonky sleep schedule? Um, so uh, anything with mental health, is it causing them distress or impairment? Um, and then again, depression is sometimes precipitated by stress in life, but not always. Um, sometimes people can just be hit with episodes out of the blue. Um, so be mindful of that as well. Um, and there's a lot of different types of depression that I'm sure you guys reviewed in your third year of medical school. Um, I won't go through all of them now. I just have a few to keep in mind. Um, so the first is depression with psychotic features. So if you do diagnose depression, screen for um, hallucinations or psychosis or paranoia, because um, often we need to add an antipsychotic as well. Um, hashing out typical bereavement versus true depression can be pretty tricky as well. Um, I'm sure you've had a lot of patients who have lost close family members or they're widowed, um, something. And um, it's important to recognize like, okay, let me just make sure that, let me ask these depression screening, screening questions anyway to make sure that there's not something worse besides standard grief. And then chronic dysthymia is another one that can be tricky. Uh, this is the one where you have two years of depressed mood that doesn't necessarily actually meet SIGI caps for depression. Um, but because it's been going on for so long, you still do need to treat these patients. And the convenient thing is the treatment is the same as depression. So uh, just something you need to recognize, but the treatment is more straightforward. All right, on to screening. Um, do you guys do screening in your clinics? Is that something you guys do or do is it like handed out with to the patients ahead of time? I think it can be variable clinic to clinic. Um, I think my clinic, we do PHQ-2 on many visits, but especially a wellness and PHQ-9 if they've like ever had a history. Okay. Um, and that seems pretty reasonable. So um, yeah, pretty much across the country, it depends on where you are. Um, the PHQ-2 is definitely the easiest. Um, anhedonia, down depressed or hopeless. If they answer no to both of those, it's pretty, you know, very low chance that they do actually have depression. Um, and then uh, anytime you're asking screening questions for depression, if they do have some symptoms, Please ask about suicide. Um, so I wanted to ask you guys too, do you typically ask about suicide? Um, are you comfortable asking? Does it just make you want to climb up a wall? Uh, I guess, how do you feel about that? And I feel, I feel like I, uh, you know, asking about suicide have become a lot more comfortable with, and then sometimes it's figuring out the, the plan on the other side, mm -hmm. um, that can sometimes feel, uh, challenging. I feel like there are oftentimes a lot of patients with sort of chronic, um, like chronic SI or, and maybe they're chronic, like passive SI is getting worse, but maybe they've had some active SI here and there, but they don't have active SI today. Um, and so I think that's where I found, um, found so it to be challenging. I don't know about other folks. Yeah. Um, those kind of chronic SI patients can be really difficult for us too. <laughs> um, it, it's just not comfortable. Um, so, uh, honestly, suicide prevention and safety planning and all that could be a whole separate lecture. Um, so I'm not going to <laughs> go into too much detail, um, but I did want to just put this slide as a reference. So um, in case you are uncomfortable asking about suicide, I have a sample way to ask about it um, that is, um, you know, that kind of meets patients where they're at. So uh, sometimes when people experience these symptoms, they feel like life is not worth living. Have you had thoughts about ending your life? Um, so that way you're not just kind of throwing the question on the patient. You're kind of like leading up to it a little bit. 
Um, other tips, be direct with it. So I kind of compare this to delivering bad news. You know, you don't want to beat around the bush with what's going on. You want to tell directly what has happened, use words like death, you know, so that there's no misinterpretation of things. Same with suicide. You're not going to plant the idea in anyone's head. Um, and anyone who is having um, serious thoughts of suicide, they're going to be reassured if you directly ask because they know that you're not scared to talk about it. Um, so uh, this is also something good to pass on to more junior residents or students because um, it's it's hard. It's hard to ask about it. Um, and then if there's any concern, um, if they have intent to end their life, if you're just not feeling safe, send them to the ER. Um, I do have additional resources for suicide prevention um, at the very end. Uh, and there's a lot of different things to implement in the clinic and kind of how to navigate more of the gray areas. But again, we just don't have quite the time to do that today. Um, and then I see a couple of questions in the chat. So how do we know if they are telling the truth? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> um, most of the time we kind of have to go with what they're telling us um you know we're not mind readers um that being said if you have legitimate concern like they've had thoughts for a while they you know their family member has talked to you and said i'm really concerned um or there's like other evidence outside um then that you know that can kind of raise your bar of okay maybe I need to do some more digging here, um, but you know even even when someone comes to the Pez if they're saying all the right things and we don't have evidence that they're lying we we can't just keep them in the hospital um, so it it can be really tricky but um, some patients know how to play the game uh, which is unfortunate but. Um, Feel free to ask, you know, like, is it okay if I call your spouse or call your parent and talk to them? Um, that's always an okay thing to ask your patient. Um, and then oftentimes, here's another question. Oftentimes this comes up after patients fought the BHQ-9. Do you ever reference their answers to that question? Um, yeah, I think that's a great way to open up the conversation. Um, be like, hey, I noticed that you checked this box for this question. Like, can you tell me more about that? Um, yeah, absolutely. I've I've definitely done that before. Um, all right, other questions about suicide? No. Okay. Um, so moving on to diagnosis. Again, I just have an example of a PHQ-9 um, just to have it there. I'm not going to go through it all. Uh, but basically, the PHQ-9 is Ziggy Caps which I have here. Uh, anyone want to run through what the SIGI cap stand for? I'm putting you on the spot here. Not hearing a ton of enthusiasm. So for the sake of time, um, we'll just run through them quickly. So sleep, interest, guilt, energy, concentration, appetite, psych motor retardation and suicidal ideation. Um, the thing that I didn't realize for a while is the guilt doesn't have to necessarily mean guilt. So it can be any just ruminating thoughts that are negative. Um, they're feeling hopeless, they're feeling worthless. Uh, that, that counts as part of the psyche caps. All right, uh, something in the chat. <laughs> One of them is sleep, yes. Um, <laughs> All right, so um, when you're diagnosing depression, there's really important psychiatric and medical things you want to rule out. Um, what's a big one for psych that you want to rule out before starting depression treatment? I want to make sure they don't have this before giving an SSRI. Like bipolar disorder. Yeah, exactly. Um, bipolar, yeah, a bunch in the chat, great. Um, so uh, screen for bipolar disorder or mania, 
there's a CD screen you can use for that. Um, and what's good to know is most patients who have new diagnosis of bipolar, they actually come in with like in a depressive episode. Um, so again, just have your radar open for this. Um, again, screen for psychotic features and then and um, anxiety, ADHD, and substance abuse are all very commonly comorbid with depression. So important to look for these because you're gonna need to treat those as well, um, or else your patient's not gonna fully get better. And then what are some medical conditions that can masquerade as depression? Hypothyroid, definitely. Deficiencies. Yeah, so there's a bunch of things. Dementia, yeah, for sure. Um, so I've got a bunch of them here. I'm sure there's more, but these are some of the more common ones. So we mentioned thyroid issues, um, sleep disorders. So actually one of my former co-residents, she was misdiagnosed with depression for a long time. And she eventually was found to have a form of narcolepsy. Um, so yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, make sure you're screening for medical conditions, even in young, otherwise healthy people. Um, anemia is a big one cancer, um, certain medications, which I didn't realize before, um, and then chronic pain and dementia as well. So this is a helpful chart, um, and I have the resource at the end, um, for different medications that can cause depression, depression symptoms. Um, I don't know how many patients I've had tell me that their beta blockers made them feel crummy, um, and there's a lot of medications that can do that. So Here's a table of ones to keep in mind, as well as ways you can um, kind of figure out how to adjust them. Treatment. All right, so if your patients are at all like mine, a lot of times they don't want to do what we recommend for them uh, for a lot of different reasons. So um, I find it helpful to go over expectations. You know, can we expect them to get better? How quickly? All of that. So. With depression, we tend to think of the rule of thirds. So about a third, and this is for, you know, first depressive episode, your first intervention that you're trying. So really at step zero, what can you expect? So about a third of patients have complete recovery, about a third have some response to the first med you try, and about a third have no response. So really, if you start any treatment, two thirds of your patients are going to get at least somewhat better, which is pretty good. Um, without treatment, most episodes last about six to 12 months. Um, and with treatment, you can get that episode down to less than three months, um, which can be huge just for life functioning, you know, a quarter of the year versus the full year. Um, so it can be pretty compelling for your patients. Um, I have a basic algorithm and we'll go over this in more detail. So um, first, again, assess for mania and other conditions assess for safety, choose a first line med. Um, after they've been on that for a few weeks, see how they're doing. If they're not getting better, then we adjust the dose of that same medication. So make sure they're at an appropriate dose before trying something else. Give them another few weeks. If they're still not responding, then we either switch or we augment. And then if at that point they're still not doing better, that's when you turn to me and my colleagues for some assistance. Um, Here's another algorithm, same resource that had that lovely medication chart. Um, so this is something that would be great to print out and keep at your clinics for reference. Um, all right, so you've diagnosed them, they want treatment, do you do meds or therapy or both? Um, so luckily you can kind of pick depending on how high they are on the PHQ-9, which can make it easy. Um, if they're mild, uh, you can, pretty much get by with just some therapy or behavioral activation. If they're moderate, you can either do meds or therapy or both, just depending on what's accessible to the patient and what they're more inclined to do. 
Um, if it's severe, that's when you want to combine meds and therapy and just follow up more frequently. Um, and then I didn't know a thing about therapy as an internal medicine resident and your patients might ask you about it. So I have very basically um, the different types of therapy and what patients might be able to expect. Um, behavioral activation, this is actually part of CBT, but this is something you can do for all of your patients. Uh, this is basically saying, don't rely on motivation to do things, just do the things. Um, so setting concrete goals for the, for your patient, like, you know, you've let your apartment turn into a mess. How about you just do three dishes today? You know, like very concrete goals um, that the patients can do. And then as they're taking care of themselves, that can help their symptoms. Um, CBT is more introspective, um, challenging uh, negative mindsets about themselves and the environment. And then interpersonal therapy helps more if depression is triggered by a big life change. So a loss or a conflict or a role change. Um, so uh, just FYI, in case your patients ask you about these things, you have a little bit of background. And then how to refer your patient to therapy. Um, this is gonna be very dependent on where you are. Um, so if you have a social worker or a case manager in your clinic, they are a fantastic resource. Um, I have a few options here, depending on whether your patients are on Medicaid or have private insurance. Um, things to keep in mind, a lot of insurance provider lists are not up to date. So encourage your patients to just call different therapy groups, call different offices, and keep trying, because um, they're probably going to get wrong numbers, or there's no availability, or there's a huge wait time, and that's part of the process. Um, so be encouraging um, and just tell your patients to keep trying. All right, now on to pharmacology. Um, so the first line meds for depression um, are SSRIs, SNRIs, um, mirtazapine, and bupropion. Um, the big thing to note with all of these is they all have an FDA black box warning for increased SI in younger patients. Um, how do you, do you guys talk about this with your patients? And if so, how do you kind of broach that topic? It's okay if you don't talk about it, that's why I'm here, so. <laughs> Um, so I never really knew how to talk about this before. So here are some tips. Um, so the newer data shows that the risk isn't actually increased. Um, so this can be really reassuring for patients. Um, the label is still there, but the data is very reassuring. Um, there haven't been any completed suicides with this. Um, and I think the absolute risk reduction in the old data was like two to or absolute risk raise was two to 4%, like going from 2% to 4%. So it was never very high, but it's there. The newer data is better. Um, but you wanna give guidance on what to do if they have suicidal ideation, which hopefully you're doing anyway if your patient is depressed. Um, so stop the medication, call the provider. If they're feeling unsafe, go to the ER. And then again, I've got some more suicide resources at the end. Um, a few clinical pearls, if a patient or if, if your patient or their family member has already benefited from a certain medication, you can start with that one. Um, pretty good chance it'll work. Um, if they've never been on antidepressants before, start with SSRIs because they're easier to taper. Um, if they also have anxiety, you want to start at half the dose um, because serotonergic meds can be pretty activating. Um, and then do not combine serotonergic agents. Please don't do this. Uh, high risk of serotonin syndrome. Um, this actually includes high dose trazodone, um, which generally higher than the dose you're gonna use as a PRN sleep aid anyway, but just to keep in mind. All right, um, so SSRIs and SNRIs. Um, the 
thing to remember is SNRIs at lower doses act just like SSRIs, and at the higher doses, that's where you get more of the adrenergic effects. So in your many patients with hypertension, vascular disease, um, just be aware of this. Uh, there's this great mnemonic I found for serotonin, head, red, fed, um, and that can, that helps me remember what serotonin does and also the side effects. Um, so head, it reduces anxiety and depression, reduces impulsivity, also reduces libido. Uh, red, it affects plate platelet binding and adhesion, and FED affects GI mobility and nausea. Um, also, SSRIs and SNRIs can lead to hyponatremia. So for your patients with heart failure or Yes. Um, so yeah, for your many patients who also have heart failure or they're on thiazides, they just might need their electrolytes monitored more often. And I remember this with sera sodium, which is a bit of a stretch, but it does help me. Um, all right, next slide. Um, so here are some of the more common SSRIs um, that I have just so you can use them as a comparison. Um, the mnemonics here are from this fantastic YouTube channel, um, which I highly recommend for anything psych or neurology related. Um, so Zoloft is one of the more common first line ones. Um, it's not uh, secreted as much in breast milk, so it's safer, which is why it's got the mnemonic of squirtuline. Um, Prozac has a few more drug interactions. Um, and what sets this one apart is its long half-life. So it can be really good if your patients have difficulty with compliance because um, it lasts a long time. So uh, long half-life, flu long atine. Um, Citalopram or Celexa can be a little less activating, so better for anxiety patients. Um, you do need to monitor QTC. And the mnemonic the video uses is Celexis. Lexus is a car, so check an electrocardiogram. Again, a bit of a stretch, but whatever helps. <laughs> um, and then escitalopram or Lexapro is uh, just the active form of Celexa, so it's pretty similar to that. Um, I do wanna be mindful of time. Um, I have a few more slides about um, some more medications as well as kind of what to do if they're not working, like switching or augmentation. Um, so I don't, I don't know if we need to stop here or if we, I can try to fly through some of those. Audrey, um, go ahead and keep going. I said to, I, there might be some folks that have to break off to go to their afternoon clinic, but I'm hoping that as many folks as um, can are gonna stick around. So yeah, go ahead. We wanna make sure you have enough time to go through. Okay, um, so let's move on to the next one. I'll try to be speedy. Um, paroxetine or Paxil, this is used less because it's got a really short half-life. Um, the only time I've used this is for menopause symptoms, which it can be great for, but if, uh, for psych patients, if they miss a dose, they get withdrawal really quickly. Um, for that reason, we also avoid in pregnancy because withdrawal symptoms can pass to the newborn. Uh, this is not from the video, but friends don't let friends prescribe paroxetine. I find useful to remember. Uh, fluvoxamine is really only used for OCD. Um, and then we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, SNRIs. So the big differences with SNRIs is that they can also help with chronic pain, which can be great. Um, they're, they are more difficult to taper. Again, look out for the adrenergic side effects and then avoid higher doses with bupropion. Um, they both go through CYP2D6. Um, so they can, the levels can be raised with that. Um, and then duloxetine, venlafaxine, and deslafaxine are three of the more common ones. Uh, next medication, bupropion. This actually works through dopamine and norepinephrine. So uh, with that, you avoid a lot of the unpleasant serotonergic side effects. Um, the side effects it does have, I like to think of as similar to caffeine. So it's a little stimulating, 
So it's probably not the best if your patient also has anxiety or agitation, um, gives you jitters and dry mouth and headache. So um, again, comparable to caffeine. Uh, lowers the seizure threshold. So contraindicated if your patients have bulimia or seizure disorders. Um, however, it's also indicated for smoking cessation and off-label for ADHD. So can be good if your patients have either of those. Um, mirtazapine is the next one. Um, this one we don't typically use first um, unless patients can't tolerate the other medications, um, but it affects adrenergic and serotonergic receptors, helps with insomnia and helps with appetite. So it can be good or bad depending on who your patient is. Um, tricyclics, you guys probably won't be prescribing them um, but I have them for completion. Basically, a lot of neurotransmitters, so it can be very effective, but the more th things you mess with in the brain, the more, more side effects you get. Um, important things to note, because they're lethal in overdose, if your patient has had a history of intentional overdose, um, not a good medication to prescribe them. Um, and also they last a really long time in the system. So if you're transitioning them to um, a first line medication, you need a good washout period just to avoid serotonin syndrome. Um, and then I've got examples. Um, the ones you might prescribe are probably amitriptyline and nortriptyline, which can help with pain. But again, be mindful of side effects. Uh, trazodone, you probably know this as a PRN sleep aid. Um, it is indicated for depression, but the doses required, uh, nobody tolerates them. So we just use it for sleep. Um, big takeaway again, avoid the higher doses in combination with other serotonergic meds. And then MAOIs, I also have for completion. Um, so they can be really effective in atypical depression. But again, the side effect profile is terrible. You need all these diet changes. So not something you guys will probably prescribe. And then uh, just so you can recognize them, these are two of the newer SSRIs. Um, they're both better than placebo, but they're not any better than the current antidepressants that we have and that we have a lot more data for. All right, so what do you do if your medication is not working? You can go ahead and click to the next part. So first thing is check the dose. Um, again, before ruling out a medication as ineffective, we wanna make sure that we've tried an adequate dose. Um, so increase the dose, recheck. Um, and if they're having side effects, you don't have to go with you know, big jumps. You can always do smaller increments. and then you've tried the optimal dose and your patient's still not responding, then at that point you uh, switch or augment. So go ahead and click to the next part. Um, there isn't any clear evidence between which one to do. It's a lot of shared decision-making with the patient. So here's kind of a little um, comparison of the two. So if you're switching from one med to the other, you can either stick with the same class or a different class. Um, make sure you think about different half-lives for cross-tapering. Up to date is your friend for everything, including this. Um, switching can be better if someone's been on a certain antidepressant for a long time and it's not working anymore, um, or if you've tried to add a medication and they just don't tolerate the side effects. Um, and then uh, augmentation, on the other hand, um, can be better in urgent situations um, because cross tapering takes a really long time. Uh, but again, you want to be mindful of combining different medications. Um, and there's a question in the chat. If one doesn't respond to Albutrin, do you add SSRI or just switch? Um, yeah, so again, uh, Shared decision making. Uh, so first, make sure you're on a high dose of Wellbutrin. Some people just don't tolerate the higher doses. Um, so, um, yeah. Ultimately, it's just deciding with the patient: have they tried SSRIs before and they didn't work? Um, 
it is safe to combine Wellbutrin and SSRIs, um, but again, be careful with SNRIs because of the, um, the enzyme, they both go through the ZIP2D6, so that can be dangerous, but SSRIs should be safe. Um, and I have this table here of different medications you can use for augmenting. Um, so Abilify, Seroquel, uh, again, Wellbutrin is here, and Mirtazapine. Um, and I have recommended doses you can use as well as side effects to look out for. And next slide. And then your patient is finally doing better after your lovely treatment for them. And they ask you, how long do I need to stay on this medication? I'm feeling fine now. Um, so the general rules of thumb. So make sure you're monitoring them regularly to make sure that they are improving. Um, once they've felt better, if it's their first episode and they don't have any other risk factors, then uh, we recommend continuing treatment for nine months after they feel better. Um, nine months is kind of the time period needed to prevent, you know, relapse into a depressive episode. Um, however, if they do have any of these risk factors, um, that's when you would think about prolonging treatment. So if they've had multiple episodes, if they have any residual symptoms, so they're not 100% better, ongoing stress, um, early or elderly age of onset or family history. Um, and I find this helpful to tell patients too, um, where if it's, if it's, if, uh, excuse me, if it's their first episode of depression, they've got about a 50-50 shot of having a recurrence at some point. Uh, whereas if it's their second episode, they've got an 80% chance. So it's pretty high. Um, so your patients might want to stay on the medication longer if they've had episodes before. And then takeaways. Uh, so depression is complex and multifactorial, as we've talked about. Uh, universal screening is recommended, um, including asking about suicide if they have any symptoms. Um, and then for treatment, you can consider therapy and or meds depending on the severity, psycho social factors, patient preferences. Um, we talked about first line medications, um, considering med interactions and side effects and other comorbids when picking a medication, and then reassess and adjust as needed. So um, I do have a few practice questions. Um, that we can either go through here, um, or if you guys need to go, feel free to send the slides out just to have them as a resource as well. Awesome, thank you so much, Audrey. I'm just looking at the clock with it being 11.40 and it looks like some folks have had to break off. I, um, if it's okay with you, I'm happy to share the PowerPoint so that folks can do those kind of on their own time. Does that sound? Okay with you? Yeah, definitely. And if you could just jump to the resources for future reference slide, it's a little bit ahead. Oh, yeah, this one. Yeah, so the one that's starred, um, that is uh, super helpful, I think. That's where I got a bunch of the charts I used. Um, and it, it's like perfect for what you need to know for primary care and even in the more complicated situations. So highly recommend checking that one out. Um, but yeah, happy I got to do this. Thank you guys for participating. I know it's not fun. <laughs> Thanks so much. I'm going to go ahead and stop the share. Thank you for joining us, Audrey. This is a great overview. Thanks everybody for your participation today. We'll see you next week's Thanksgiving. So no academic half day next week. Happy Thanksgiving. We'll see you the following week. <laughs>